So my name is Michael. I have two German Shepherds, of which this is one. His name is O'Connor. O'Connor vom Haus Trendy. And I have two Dutch Shepherds, uh, which I have been training extensively with Richard over the past year and a quarter at this point. I don't live in the United States. Uh, I am American. But for the past two years, I've lived in France, where I've lived before. I thought that when I moved to Europe for the second time, and I did so with Connor, that when I engaged in dog training, I would do so in the area that had the best dog trainers in the world. And so when I got there and I started to look around, I looked in Germany, I looked in France, I looked elsewhere, I was shocked to surpri and surprised to find out that the more investigation I did, the more I kept coming back to this guy in Miami who in fact over and over again seemed to truly be the best dog trainer in the world. And as I began my journey of dog training with Richard, I found out very quickly that that supposition that I had turned out to be exactly true. And I, there I was sitting in Europe <laughs> talking to someone in Miami, Florida of all places about dog training because he was the best in the world and he was exactly in the place that I didn't expect him to be whatsoever. So fortunately, I was able to work with Richard, with Connor, and later on with the Dutch Shepherds, and now with my newest German Shepherd, on a wide variety of things, from elite level obedience. Sit, hut, sit, hut, sit, yeah. shield, 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 shield. Good. Chill. Put. Yes. Put. for a little bit, keep going back. Straight back, because if you do too much of that. Good, then give him. Yes! Right. To elite, elite protection skills and capabilities. Oh, shit. Oh, 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 oh
Good. Pass off. Pass off. Pass off. Pass off. Pass off. Pass off. Richard, pack it. Oh, shit. God damn. Revere. Move it a little bit. Right, move it a little, Aaron. Move it. to the other end and check that out. I can't get to it. And then more to come in the way of service dog training and search and rescue. Pull. There you go. Yes. Next. Next. Come on. Pull. Yes. Good boy. Yes. Good boy. Pull. Good boy. Yes. All right. 
We touch. Have, right. Good. Uh, touch. Good. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, feeds right away. Yeah, the right one. I'm so used to being the left. So that was unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, the athleticism and the, the I mean, it was will, determination. Okay, action. Search. Yeah, 41 seconds. So it's been a very convoluted journey. It's been a very exciting journey. It's been a very emotionally volatile journey. Training dogs is not for the faint of heart, not at this level. Um, and it's not been something I would trade for anything else. I've done a lot of other things in my life that are very adventurous and very, um, demanding and this has been one of the most adventurous one of the most demanding uh, probably the most emotionally volatile in terms of the highs that you feel when things go right and the lows and frustrations that you feel when things don't go right and uh, Richard throughout the entirety of this process with me has been right there for me as my guide and as my leader and it's been a fantastic gratitude that I have felt internally 
uh, to have him there and assisting me throughout this process every single step of the way. I had tremendous um, biases that I think most people with dogs that love dogs that have investigated training to some degree or another come into the conversation with things around e-collars, things around prong collars, misunderstandings that I think every human being has about these tools or in many cases correct understandings about these tools but misunderstandings about how they can be implemented and in fact are implemented by someone like Richard. I don't know if there's anyone else in the world that uses these tools in the way that he uses them but the way that I've been taught to use them has been exactly the opposite of what I thought that they were intended for, exactly the opposite of the results that we achieve with them, and exactly the opposite of what I think everyone thinks about when they think about these tools. At least I know that it's the opposite of what I thought. So there's been incredible hurdles for me to jump, and I'm just so incredibly glad that I have the natural curiosity to check those biases, verify whether that they were actually correct or not, and continue with the conversation with the open mind that I was blessed enough to have and achieve the results that that open-mindedness ended up um, allowing me to achieve. So there's really two aspects to every program that you go through almost regardless of what it is. There is the breadth of the program and there is the depth of the program. The program here I'm going to talk about first, this is Rebel by the way, Rebel du Blazana Croix d'Argent. She just turned one year old last month, she is now 13 months old. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with the program here with Richard is the breadth and by that I'm talking about all the various disciplines that you focus on while you're here. So for example, there were other programs that I looked at before I spoke with Richard and I got a very good understanding of what you covered while you were in those programs. I'm not gonna talk about anyone else's program. But for example, one thing that you don't cover in any of them is aggression. And aggression wasn't even something that was the major focus or major component of what we covered here. And yet what we saw here with it being a tangential component is something that you would not see, like I said, anywhere else. So we had one of Richard's clients who had an American Bulldog come here that uh, Richard addressed, and by addressed I mean fixed with respect to the aggression that this Bulldog was having. It was dog to dog aggression. So bad that the Bulldog had attacked someone else's dog and either severely hurt the dog or killed it. I think killed it. I can't remember, this is two months ago that we were looking at this case. And in three sessions with Richard, the bulldog was fixed. And I don't mean that the aggression was curtailed or covered up or could be dealt with via avoidance, which is how every other trainer deals with it that I've seen, but fixed as in this bulldog isn't going to be aggressive with any other dogs ever again. That level of fix. It was shocking to see this. I've seen a bunch of his videos, Richard's videos on YouTube where he's, a, where he's fixed, uh, you know, or allegedly fixed dogs. Um, but to see this in person, the methodology that he's described to me over the phone on our Skype sessions actually play out was amazing. Uh, and not only that, I saw it with my own dogs who had aggression with each other. Uh, I think I had one, two, three dogs go after other dogs, three of my own four dogs go after other dogs while we were here and they have now all been fixed and it was all fixed very easily. So for me this is amazing, it's shocking, it's something that the world doesn't understand about dogs in general and about Richard's capabilities in particular. Um, so that was, I mean that in and of itself was worth the course, to see dogs with aggression get fixed that was worth all of the time and all of the expense and that was just a tangent. Hey pretty girl. So that was one piece of the breath. Another piece of the breath that is amazing that I had the fortune of studying under Richard is the decoy work associated with protection. So I thought 
that decoy work is really simple. You put on a bite suit or a bite sleeve, you go out there, you take the bite, that's it, that's your job. Your job is to get bit by a dog and to do so in a way that's safe. It couldn't be further from the truth. Decoy work is incredibly complicated to do well. It's incredibly complicated to do right. You learn, or I learned anyway, so much about dogs and dog training and how dogs behave and how to bring a dog out by doing the decoy work that Richard, that Richard teaches. It was shocking. I don't think that there's anyone else in the world that teaches what he teaches because I don't think there's anyone else in the world that knows what he knows and how to do decoy work. It is, it should be its own course that should be taught by Richard to the world's best handlers, period, in my opinion. And I've been encouraging him to consider that. It is next, to say it's the next level is, it doesn't do it justice. It's revolutionary, it was amazing, and we only scratched the surface is what is perhaps the most amazing thing. So that was fascinating. The e-collar work, you know when you're stepping into the ring with Richard Hines, it's going to be a major component of it. But the complexity of e-collar work, the fact that no one else teaches e-collar work the way he teaches it, no one else thinks about dogs the way he thinks about dogs, so therefore they can't utilize the tools in the way that he utilizes them. Case in point, Rebel here, this orange e-collar that she's been wearing, she's been wearing since she was three months old. I always thought if you put an e-collar on a dog, you're going to destroy the dog, you're going to do all sorts of damage to the dog. The reason I thought this is because undoubtedly this happens, but this does not happen with Richard. It does not happen if you know how to use e-collars and you know how to use them appropriately. As you can see, she's 13 months old, which means she's had 10 months of e-collaring and she's anything but destroyed, anything but <laughs> exhibiting a lack of spirit and anything but lack of affection. And she's had the e-collar basically her whole life since she was three months old. So again, speaking to the breadth of experiences that you get here. Obedience, not like anyone else's obedience. One of the most amazing things I learned here is just how important it is for the trainer to have a certain energy and approach to dog training. I can't, I can't state it enough, whether you're doing luring with treats, e-collar work, obedience, protection, whatever you're doing. Good girl. Hup. Good girl. It doesn't matter um, who you are as a trainer, the energy you embody, the approach that you take, little tiny things that you do. <laughs> this, this, is, this is all absolutely critical to being a great dog trainer. And I don't think anyone else teaches that because I don't think anyone else knows it. One of the other things, and then this now we're going into the depth of the program. Understanding e-collars, understanding prong collars, these are a, refle a reflection of the understanding of pressure in dogs. And the fact that you think that if you apply pressure to your beloved dog, you're going to hurt the dog or stymie the dog in some way. Undoubtedly true if you do it incorrectly. The way that I was taught to do it, the way that Richard does it, and you're not going to believe this because I choked on this for months, this concept, is that pressure is good. It is good for dogs. It makes them better. It makes them settled. It reduces anxiety. It reduces problems that dogs have. If all you do is treat your dogs, if all you do is be kind to your dogs, if all you do is baby your dogs and use positive only methods instead of the appropriate, and I emphasize appropriate use of pressure, you're going to have dogs that are not as happy as they would be otherwise. Otherwise meaning if you use pressure appropriately. Riptide is a case in point. You can see how affectionate she is and she has had a great deal of pressure. But because we used it at the right times, in the right ways, it made her better. It made her happier. It made her more spirited, more enthusiastic, and more affectionate. We've seen this with Riptide, we've seen it with Rebel, we've seen it with all of my dogs, and I've seen it with little golden retriever puppies that we've trained. I've seen it with the American Bulldog that we trained for aggression, pressure, 
in any of its forms and it needs to be balanced with positive, it needs to be balanced with positive energy, but the appropriate use of pressure, how to think about that, how to implement it, how to adapt to it in certain situations for this dog versus that dog. The depth of that has been unbelievably fascinating and completely counterintuitive and counter to what everyone in the world, including myself formerly, thinks about utilizing pressure in dog training. As you can see, no affection problems here. So that, again, speaking to the depth has been fascinating and I don't think anyone else teaches that. I don't think anyone else knows it. Certainly not anyone else that I've talked to. So as I walk away from this, today is the second to last of the days of the three month program. One thing that I know is that I know and have learned more than I'm even aware of right now. And all of that is gonna be cementing in my mind over the course of the next weeks and months. And I was oversaturated for the first couple of months while I was here and it has all been coming together in the last several weeks. And it is amazing the versatility that I have now with respect to being able to address service dogs, protection dogs, dogs for obedience, dogs that have problems, social problems, dogs that have idiosyncratic problems that need to be addressed. They're afraid to walk up the stairs, their doorbell rings, they run to the door, they jump all over people inappropriately, um, you name it. I now have a way of looking at dogs, understanding dog psychology, understanding dog behavior that I'm just grateful to have where I can now look at dogs in those situations and understand what's happening and understand potential solutions. The complexity that we dealt with here certainly are some of the most complicated things that have ever been done by human beings with dogs. Training two dogs to work in coordination with each other in protection scenarios, the things that we did with her and her sister, I don't think they've ever been done before. I don't think anyone else has tried to do it. I don't think anyone else can conceive of how to do it. Um, and I don't think anyone else has actually been able to do it. So that has been incredible. But aside from that, just simple things that are simpler things that apply in service dog situations, search and rescue, finding, all of the variety of things that one can do with a dog we've been exposed to. There's no other program on earth that gives you that. And for Richard to come out and share his knowledge and share, hop, share his expertise, again, I'm just incredibly grateful for it. The things so that's been my experience. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything else in the world. I'm glad that I stumbled upon him. Um, I'm glad that I found him and I am incredibly glad that he made the time to work with me and assist me in achieving the things that I wanted to do. And very excited about the future, what it holds and where I'm able to take what I've learned thus far forward. So